Good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to, um, to this meeting of the Buxbaum Institute. Uh, I show you up on the first slide uh, some of the goals of the Buxbaum Institute, which was founded in September of 2011. Uh, the goals include improving patient care, strengthening the doctor-patient relationship, and improving communication and decision-making between patients and physicians. Um, our speaker today, uh, Dr. Robert Smith, uh, a professor of medicine and psychiatry at Michigan State University, is, I think, clearly uh, the expert in the country on what has come to be known as the biopsychosocial model of medicine. In, in a formative paper in 1977, uh, published in the journal Science, um, uh, Dr. George Engel, a teacher of Dr. Smith's, um, entitled the paper, The Need for a New Medical Model, a Challenge for Biomedicine. And in this rather lengthy paper in the journal Science, uh, Dr. Engel, who is a professor of medicine and psychiatry uh, at Rochester, laid out a real challenge uh, to the traditional biomedical model and insisted that it was scientifically inadequate uh, to take care of patients. And um, so we are so delighted and privileged that um, doc, Dr. Smith uh, is with us today. Uh, Dr. Smith has received many awards for outstanding clinical care and for medical education research, including the George Engel Research Award uh, for research in the field of doctor-patient communication. Dr. Smith's early focus was on medical communication and the doctor-patient relationship. Um, he developed the first evidence-based recommendations for medical interviewing. Out of that research, uh, Dr. Smith wrote a textbook, uh, which is now in its third edition. And the book is used extensively as one of the basic texts in this country to teach medical interviewing. More recently, Dr. Smith's focus has been on providing medical students and residents uh, training in primary care mental health issues. And Dr. Smith's aim is to have medical students and primary care residents become as effective and comfortable in diagnosing and treating depression and anxiety as they are with, say, diabetes and hypertension. And to implement this approach, Dr. Smith has developed a continuous curriculum of 80 hours a year across all years of training for medical students and residents. Uh, today, Dr. Smith will, will speak to us um, on the topic of establishing the scientific validation of the biopsychosocial model of care. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Smith. Mark, thank you. It's a delight to be here. University of Chicago has always been at the forefront in academic medicine and in education, but also many people don't know this in biopsychosocial medicine. Mark, Marshall, many people here have worked in ethics and have done a tremendous job as well as in the doctor-patient relationship. So it's a delight to be here. Um, I'm also honored to be here at the Buxbaum Institute. I've been in this business of doctor-patient communication since 1985, and I have never seen anything that even approaches the magnitude and potential of this. This is really a wonderful opportunity to help advance the field from its scientific dimensions. There's also a significant responsibility that goes with this. And I can tell you that the leadership Mark is offering, you're in the best hands possible to do this. Uh, and ultimately, operationalizing the transformative vision that the Buxbombs had. So thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the opportunity. 
improve care, strengthen the doctor-patient relationship, DPR, enhance communication. Um, I've highlighted a couple of these, doctor-patient relationship and communication. They are the most proximate elements of these four mission that of the Buxbaum Institute. Um, indeed, communication and DPR are what lead to improved decision making and improved care. Communication, DPR, is our focus today. I want to go back here now to the Buxbaum mission. Emphas whoops, emphasizing a different thing here. Improve care, strengthen DPR, enhance communication. Improve, strengthen, enhance. All of these things seem to request a change in something. Something to do back with the basic objectives, communication in the DPR. Well, what are you going to change? It can't be anything but our current communication DPR practices, can it? Um, and well, what's to change there? And Matt Sorrentino has kindly volunteered to let me interview him. We're going to perform two interviews. I'm going to start out and do a standard doctor-centered interview. This is the sort of thing people are seeking to change, and I, I think you will see why. Um, so, Matt, come on up and we'll... <laughs> <laughs> so, good morning. Uh, oh, I wanted to tell you, uh, Dr. Sorrentino, the, the scenario here, this is somewhat realistic for him. He has been through some of these things. We're not going to go into the entire thing. I am the admitting physician or the admitting resident um, on his second hospitalization, and that's as much explanation as we'll give you at this point. Good morning, Dr. Sorrentino. I'm Dr. Smith. Good morning, Dr. Smith. I'm going to be taking care of you here. What's got you in here? Well, my I, I haven't read the records yet, but I... Yeah, my, my symptoms started um, about three days ago. I was actually at a meeting, okay. and I was supposed to give some presentations at well, the what meeting. Were, what were the symptoms? I had some uh, severe abdominal pain. Uh, it started as a cramping abdominal pain with nausea. Where, where was it? Can you point? It's right in the center of my abdomen where, where the pain was. And uh, I was really concerned that I wasn't going to be able to give my lectures and uh -huh. do what I had to do because the pain kept occurring. Did you say three days? Three days ago is when is the, the first pain started. Had never occurred? Had never occurred before three never days ago. Before then. But it's been persistent since then. Okay. And now my big worry is I've got a big panel of patients I have to see tomorrow, and if this pain continues, I'm not going to be able to do the work that I need to do. Yeah, okay. How, how has your appetite been with all of this? Very poor. Every time I try to eat, it makes the pain worse, and so I've not been eating anything for the last uh, three days. Okay, okay. How, any bloody black stool? No, like um, a little bit of uh, a diarrhea, but uh, no blood. Um, uh, uh, mostly just the inability to eat and the pain and throwing up. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, not only am I worried I'm not going to be able to see my patients, but, you know, my uh, wife's worried we're supposed to go on vacation this weekend mm -hmm. and doesn't look like yeah. we're going to be able to if I'm here in the hospital. Yeah. Any other problems you've had, you know, like heart trouble or blood pressure? Or no other like medical that. problems uh, in the past. Yeah. Uh, my blood pressure's usually been normal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cut. That's the way we stop a role play. We could go on and on with this, but <laughs> you probably hope I don't. <laughs> um, uh, let me get some feedback first uh, from Matt. How, how, how did that feel to you as a patient in that interaction? Well, I, I thought it was an interesting interaction. I mean, what you're getting at is my symptoms. And um, as I think a lot of us do, you want to get rid of all of the extraneous stuff, which is all my worries about giving my lectures and going on vacation and taking care of patients. And you kept trying to direct just towards the symptoms. Yeah. How, how does it feel to you sitting there? worried about all these things. Well, I mean, on one hand, I do want my physician to find out what's wrong with me, so I'm mm -hmm. glad that you're kind of coning in on what the symptoms yeah. are. 
yeah. On the other hand, uh, it's almost like you're ignoring these other things and pushing it away yeah. like it's not important, and yet, okay. to me, it's important. Okay, good, good. Well, let's stop for now. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. I hope we can do a better job. <laughs> um, so, math has indicated pretty much what the literature indicates. We interrupt in an average of 18 seconds. There have been more recent studies come out wherein it's now up to 24 seconds. Uh, I hope you don't take great comfort in that. <laughs> um, whoops. We do not allow completion of the opening statement in 69% of cases. And look at this. We omit 90% of relevant personal data about the patient. You could see me doing that regularly here to him. There's just loads of personal data underlying that that I'm ignoring. Okay, almost everybody agrees this should be changed. Uh, patients certainly do. You hear about that all the time. The Institute of Medicine, AAMC, Healthy People 2020, President's New Freedom Commission, and it goes on and on of the people who want to change this. Our professional organizations do. Mission statements in most medical schools decry this. What does everybody want? More personhood of the patient in medicine. Well. Okay, we're going to change. What is it exactly we're going to change to? And most people, to get the personhood, psychosocial, mental, emotional dimensions, believe that it is the patient-centered interaction. Um, I'm now going to interview Matt again, same scenario, using a patient-centered interview. Do you all have the handout? I can't remember, Angela. Not, okay. Um, I am following a method here. It's got five steps and 21 sub-steps that we will talk about in a little bit. So we I'm knocking to come in. Come in. Good morning, Dr. Sorrentino. I'm Dr. Smith. I'm going to be taking care of you here. Uh, nice to meet you, Dr. Smith. Did you get settled in okay up here? They were having some trouble with you. Yeah, it took a while to that. come up to the from the emergency room, but this looks like uh, this is my room, so uh, okay. looks like I'll be here uh, for a while. I apologize for that. It's been a hassle for a lot of people. Uh, we've got, I'm glad we got about 30, 40 minutes so I can get to the bottom of what's going on with you, and I've got a lot of questions to ask, but what I want to know most, what's bothering you? What kind of problems have brought you in here? Well, what brought me in here is some severe abdominal pain. Um, I was at a meeting giving a lecture, got okay. severe abdominal pain, okay. nausea. That's important, and we'll get back to that. Is there anything else, any other problems? I've had um, uh, what feels like a little bit of a fever. I've had some diarrhea. Um, kind of going along with this, it sounds. Along with the okay. abdominal pain, and I've yeah. found it a little bit difficult to eat. Okay, okay. Tell me more about the abdominal pain. It's a cramping pain, it's severe, it's in the middle of my abdomen, um, mm -hmm. it's uh, associated with some bloating and nausea. Okay. Say more about what's going on with it. Um, well, it's, uh, I, I don't know how else to describe it, it's continuous, uh, it tends to wax and wane. Mm -hmm. um, it uh, certainly is to the point where I can't function because of the severity of the pain. Can't function at... Well, this all started uh, when I was at a meeting. I was supposed to give some lectures. I had to bow out of the lectures because uh, the pain was uh, getting uh, uh, bad. Um, I'm supposed to be in a uh, clinic tomorrow and seeing patients, mm -hmm. but here I am in the hospital, and if I'm having all this pain, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. How does that make you feel? You can't get to your patients, you messed up at a meeting? And well, I'm very worried about this. I mean, I've been a healthy person all my life. I've never been sick. I've never been in the hospital except to work, which is a lot different. Yeah. So, and yeah. uh, now all of a sudden I'm here and I'm having this pain and yeah. I've, I don't even know what to do about my patients yeah. tomorrow. I'm going to have to someone call say, them all you up. You say never been sick, worried about? Well, I've never been sick before and so now I've got something that I don't know what it is and so I'm worried about uh, what this is. Um, you know, my abdomen's getting bloated and distended. Yeah. I'm 
worried well, I have a bowel those, obstruction. And what goes through your mind with this could be? Well, you know, the trouble with being a physician, I think we yeah. know too much, you yeah. know, and yeah, so everything from uh, uh, bowel obstruction due to cancer to yeah. Crohn's disease to yeah. who knows what it is is going through my mind. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you're worried and I can understand. It makes sense. Uh, I appreciate your sharing it. It kind of helps me to work better with you and figure out what, what we need to do here. But it's been a tough time for you. Well, it's uh, not something I'm used to. I'm used to being yeah. on the other side of the, uh, the, side the, of the equation. Bed, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, when it happens to you, of course, you, you don't think as clearly. And so that's why all of these things come through my mind. I mean, yeah. the physician I saw in the ER reassured me that it's probably nothing serious, yeah. but we don't know yet. And so until scary, we know. It's though, you're telling me. It is scary. I mean, the, when you don't know what it is, and um, I've got all these obligations I have to do, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do them. Yeah. I'm worried about so my family. Kind of, there's kind of that added layer on top of it. Absolutely. It? Yeah. Right. Well, I, I think I understand, and I in a tough time. If it's okay, I'd like to shift gears a little bit and ask some specifics about the pain. Is that okay? Certainly. Yeah. Tell me exactly how long that's been going on. So it started three days ago. Just three um, days ago. Okay. And what's gone on since then? So the pain's gotten gradually worse, worse. and more persistent, um, associated now with nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And bloody black stools, anything like that? No, uh, it's mostly just watery stools, um, but it's becoming more frequent, and I'm not able to take in much fluid. I'm afraid I'm getting dehydrated. Yeah, okay. Cut. Let's stop. Good. <laughs> so reflect, Matt, on that. How, how, did, how did that come across to you, and particularly in comparison to the other yeah. one? So I think this was interesting. As you noticed, I decided this time to start by only telling you what my symptoms were. I noticed. <laughs> so, you know, I didn't talk about the lecture and about my family and things like that. I just talked about my symptoms. But yet um, you seemed more concerned, more empathetic. You started telling me how it worried me. You started asking me um, not just about the symptoms, but um, what other concerns that I had. And, mm -hmm. and so it did start coming out that I was worried about my lectures and my patients. And, yeah. and you even brought out more personal fears. Um, what was I afraid of? Yeah. Um, did I have cancer? Did I have yeah. a bowel obstruction? Yeah. All of which um, didn't even get addressed in the first interview. Right, right. Okay, good. Any comment? We can take one or two comments on either interview. Anything people would like to share, maybe their own personal experience? Okay, if not, we'll go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Very good job. Um, <laughs> okay. So, everybody would agree that what we're doing in the patient centered interview is more humanistic. No question about that. Now, what people don't recognize is that it is more scientific. Patients, like Matt, have improved understanding and recall, improved satisfaction. This leads to improved compliance uh, with uh, recommendations, adherence, some people say. Uh, fewer malpractice suits, this makes the hospitals happy, and uh, less doctor shopping. But the biggest deal in all of this is here. When interviewing someone in a patient-centered way, health outcomes are demonstrably better. Surgical obstetric cases have shorter hospitalizations, are less complicated. Um, cancer people do better. Hypertension, diabetes, acid peptic disease, all of these things heal and are controlled more quickly. Okay, now we're getting into trouble. Everybody agrees, the Buxbaum Institute, the Institute of Medicine, everybody else, you all do after seeing these two interviews, I'm sure. Why has nothing happened? Here's what medical education looks like, and it's been this way for essentially over 100 years. The only way we now address in most medical schools the personhood of the patient is an interviewing course in year one, and those have only been going on in the last 20 years or so, and a psychiatry rotation in year three 
Both of these may be as infrequent as four and as long as eight weeks. That's all the formal training we get. Now, I know you have mentor relationships and models and so on, but that's all the formal training we are given. Residencies are even worse. Internal medicine, where I am, we average 17 hours per year. That's one noon conference a month where people come late and leave early. What do they leave early for? To go to their clinic. In that clinic, there is a prevalence of mental health disorder, DSM mental health disorder of 25%. It's 50% when you count all the other less severe mental disorders. We give them 17 hours a year to take care of all that. And what we're pointing at, Don Berwick articulated this nicely, is a fundamental flaw in medical education. The very people, our patients, who support us have needs for care with respect to the personhood and mental and social aspects of their care. We in medicine are not training our people to do this. When we are critical of what is now going on, it's not your fault and it's not mine. We're doing what we've been taught. The fundamental flaw is here in medical education, and it dates to about 100 years ago. Okay, so why is medical education so slow to come around? Well, we're guided by a theoretical model called the biomedical model or the disease-only model or the biotechnical model. This is what doctor-centered interviewing fulfills, it's disease-focused, and you saw that in the first interview. Let me be very clear. What we now do works. All major medical and surgical advances have come under this. This is powerful and useful and not to be dismissed in any way, shape, or form. The problem is that the educational methods, curricula, are ingrained over 100 years to teach just how to take care of disease and lead, indeed, to all these advances. So if we are to change, and everybody says we must, we are going to need a theoretical basis that outstrips the current biomedical disease-only focus. We have to have a better theoretical basis for doing this and it must add the psychosocial, emotional, mental domain without <coughs> excuse me, jeopardizing all of these major present disease benefits. This is leading now to our focus today on the biopsychosocial model. This model stems from general system theory, and I'm not going to go into this in any depth except to say that the conceptual aspects of general system theory are what led to all the revolutionary changes in physics, chemistry, cybernetics, biology, as they adopted this more modern approach to science, scrapping the old Newtonian X causes why approach to which medicine still adheres over a hundred years later. So we're going to focus a little bit more on this now. Here is the natural systems hierarchy. This is the basis of general system theory. You can see way down here off the map is where physics, chemistry, I just have on here what applies to medicine, but physics, chemistry, so on, organelles, cells, tissue, body, person, family, community, on up. Up above that, the Earth, the solar system, the Milky Way, and on beyond. The precepts, the fundamental precept, that is a progressively, a progressive increasing complexity as you go up here. Any one of these given levels is an identifiable system. That's the term systems theory comes from. The idea is that any given system is made up of multiple facets of its subset. These interact to create a new, 
what is an unpredictable new system. People do not understand these interactions. It's a major question in science today. It's a so-called emergent effect of something new, non-predictable. Um, and, and so this operates all the way up. What, what, at whatever level, the level below it makes it up. It makes up the next level in this unique emergent way. And so we've talked about physics is down here, histology might be here. Of course, they look on either side. Tissues and organelles up here. Anthropology is a science. It's here, we'd look above and also down at communities and families. Question I've got for you. What is the focus of medicine as our science? Anybody? What is the focus of medicine as a science? Here you go. There's a brave soul. People. People, yes, of course. It's the person. That's where we're here to take care of. Patients, people. Okay? Let's go back to general system theory. Here's what we do right now. We are at the sub-people level. Important as it may be, this is the biomedical model right here that we now operate under. The biopsychosocial model adds the person as well as these higher level social dimensions to create the biopsychosocial model. Note, as we see on the next slide, we now include the overlooked personhood of the patient, but we have maintained these important disease benefits conveyed by the biomedical model. The biomedical model is now simply part of the biopsychosocial model. This is just what we're looking for. And George Engel, back as Mark said in 1977, published in Science, he articulated this. This is nothing new. People since Hippocrates have been talking about including the person head of the uh, hood of the patient. Engel, however, systematized it. He made it scientific. He linked it to general system theory. This is why this was so important. And you can see, if it ever gets implemented, why it is so important, important to medicine. Uh, George was a teacher, mentor, and later became a great personal friend. He recruited me out of practice in Des Moines, Iowa to come back and take a fellowship there, and I then stayed on faculty before I came to Michigan State. Um, George is the greatest teacher I've ever seen, the greatest mentor. He always had time, and I'm not the only one that says that. He had something like 200 fellows over time, much like Mark does here. Uh, and, and he had time for everybody. Wonderful teacher. Just, just one other comment on the magnitude of what George did. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize at least three times that I'm aware of. He, of course, never won it because he was not focusing at the disease level where people describing RNA changes and genetic changes all win these prizes. But I still propose, and those prizes are important and that work is important, just like our work on disease is important. But I propose that Engel, maybe by the end of this century, will go down as one of the top five most influential physicians in the last century. Okay, now, we've got this biopsychosocial model. It looks like the answer. It came out in 77. Why have things not changed? Good question. Well, Engel agreed with what I'm about to say, at least for the most part. Many people, myself included, believe that as articulated by Engel, the biopsychosocial model is not scientific. It does stem from the modern theory of science, general system theory, but that doesn't mean it is scientific itself. Um, it's not testable. You can't even make predictions from it. It's simply, many people say, a rationale for the mind-body connection. 
it's too general. It seems to require all biopsychosocial data about every patient. It's certainly inefficient. It doesn't apply to the individual patient. Here is the biggest part, and these are all kind of overlapping here. There's no method. Engel simply said, you must have a biologic, psychologic, and social description of the patient. Fifth general system theory makes sense. Nobody ever told us how to get that information. And what's the process? This is what got lost in all this. Nobody ever talked about the method or the process. So there's a fundamental flaw in the biopsychosocial model. We have to answer exactly how do doctors efficiently identify essential data in each individual. What we need to do this is a repeatable method that consistently identifies relevant BPS information. So I'm going to digress a tiny bit to make an important point here. We started out doing interviews and talking about interviewing, and now we're talking about models and general system theory. How do these go together? Well, the biopsychosocial model, as I've said, is content. We need the interviewing is the process by which you get that content. This is much less known and is now going to be our next focus because the interview is the key to making the biopsychosocial model scientific. Okay, you've seen the two types of interview. Doctor-centered gives disease data. This is easy to do. We simply take over, ask questions. We've been taught to do this since we were this high. Um, Patient-centered is much more difficult. It generates the psychosocial data, but it is difficult because it's somewhat counterintuitive, the way we've been taught and the way we've been raised. Uh, give the patient some control. Ask about their emotions. Ask about their person. That's counterintuitive. We've been taught not to do that. Um, now, many people will ask me, Bob, which of these is the best then? And they expect me to say, patient-centered, of course. That's not the case. Neither one of those in isolation is much value. They rather need to be integrated. Patient-centered starts it out, move to doctor-centered. About 90% of the point time is still spent doctor-centered looking for disease data. To reiterate the problem in U.S. medicine, the first interview I did here is the isolated doctor-centered interview. Um, this is not coming through well. You can look up over here. This is just a reiteration. The red part is patient-centeredness. The blue part, doctor-centered. Once you get there, you sometimes need to go back and be patient-centered. The yellow is where you do the physical. And the last one is where you talk to the patient and explain what's happened. Um, the red part, patient-centered, generates this key personhood data as well as key physical data. Doctor-centered generates key physical data and routine psychosocial data of the sort that comes from the family history. Put them together, you've got the biopsychosocial model. Here's another way to think about this. Here's what we know today mainly is the biopsychosocial model, but as I'm telling you, this integrated interview is simply the flip side of the same coin. The interview is the biopsychosocial model. Okay, so patient-centered interviewing seems to be the key. Um, this began in the mid-80s at the University of Western Ontario. Uh, Ian McWinney, Joseph Levenstein, and a whole host of people worked there and were highly effective in developing this. Let the patient lead, use open-ended questions, don't interrupt, some very general guidelines. This led to much very productive research in the field. Uh, the field burgeoned, it grew. There are many people starting to become highly active and very productive. This is now widely espoused. All mission statements in this country in medical schools contain the term patient-centered, I would bet. Okay, it's one of the six domains of quality from the Institute of Medicine. 
The field, however, soon recognized that there was still a problem with patient-centered interviewing. It hadn't been defined. Nobody said specifically what it was. One person would say, here's the way we do it. Another would say, here's the way we do it. Another, I like to do it this way. Well, these unfortunately often were not only the same, but often contradictory. So that it was impossible to teach it in a systematic way and absolutely impossible to test the patient-centered interview in a randomized control trial. You couldn't define the independent variable. So you could not make the biopsychosocial model scientific because you can't define the process to get it. So it is with that backdrop, with all this rich work from Engel to McWinney to Levenstein to all these highly productive researchers that we were fortunate at Michigan State to get funding and based on what these people had all done, standing on the shoulders of giants as we say, uh, I'm now going to present some work we have done at Michigan State since 1985 which we think is the first step in making the patient-centered method scientific and therefore the biopsychosocial model scientific. In 1991 in the Annals of Internal Medicine, again in 96 in the first edition of my textbook, we identified the first behaviorally defined patient-centered model. Behaviorally defined means there are specific behaviors you go through and that makes it repeatable, consistent, reliable in scientific terms. Um, in 98, again published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, we demonstrated that the method was easily and effectively learned by family medicine and internal medicine residents in a randomized controlled trial. In 06 and 09, we demonstrated that the model was associated with positive health outcomes in a couple randomized controlled trials. In fairness to the field and my good friend Rich Frankel, who is a co-author on my textbook, in 2011 he published a very similar model and demonstrated that it was easily learned by residents. Uh, they have not yet linked it to patient outcomes, but I expect that they will. This model is very similar and they are essentially interchangeable. His emphasizes more the end part of the interview, ours is the first part. The interview that I did with Matt is this five-step, 21-sub-step model. Um, and and there, all of those come out in there and that is how we teach that. Okay. Well, is this really learnable and efficient? It takes much time when learning this, and this is one of the things people have to understand. This is not intuitively apparent. There's more to this than being a nice guy or being a respectful person. We all are that way, I hope. But there is much more to it than that. Um, we do know that our students, residents, and workshop people after one or two sessions can have some beginning facility with it. We train our students for eight weeks, once a half day a week. They do three supervised interviews. They're quite good at it after the third interview. I have just finished a group of residents. We train them. They've got ten supervised interviews in this and they are quite good at it. When somebody has learned it, it becomes very efficient. I think this interview I did with Matt here probably didn't take three or four minutes. Um, in the literature, Wendy Levinson, who is speaking here uh, I think in April, has done research that demonstrates this does not add any extra time at all. It is highly efficient. Much of the information about the disease part I actually picked up in the patient-centered interview. Um, so, and, and I'm going back through kind of these criticisms of why the biopsychosocial model is not scientific. Does this apply to the individual patient and just their unique problems? Or are we just asking the same questions of everybody, like a social or family history? 
Well, our research on patients indicates we're developing highly unique stories. We do not, these are not, these steps and substeps are not rote questions of some sort like a family history. Rather, they are simply signposts that one touches in going through the interview. They are guidelines for the behaviors that take place there, each generating radically different information from the patient and, and from each different patient. Um, highly unique stories. Finally, someone listened. She really understood me and what I needed. Extraordinarily high patient satisfaction with these, and I'll show you something on that in a minute. Here's the key question. We've answered these other questions about whether the biopsychosocial model is scientific. Is it testable? Well, and I'm showing you some data now from some slides. I'm not going to go into the studies. I simply want to indicate that we now can do interventional studies because we can define the independent variable, which is patient-centered method. This was a study of uh, somatizing uh, psychiatric type patients. Um, they received an intervention with the patient-centered method appended to uh, pharmacologic measures and cognitive behavioral measures. Long and short of it was there was a significant change in the mental component summary of the SF36 at a clinically, not just statistical, but clinically significant level. Um, you can do interventional studies now. This has not been possible in the past, and it's one of the things that has held the field back. Here is the satisfaction scale. Baseline, they're about the same. Treatment group, way up, stays up. This actually goes up clear back here. Um, here's another study. Um, any one of us, if we're putting in an MRI magnet and we receive a painful shock, our anterior insula lights up. And the reason for that is this is where bodily and emotional, other types of threat, are made conscious. Okay, we interviewed two groups of people, one doctor-centered, one patient-centered, put them in the magnet, stimulated their arm. Immediately after the interview, the picture of the doctor was shown in the, in the magnet to each of them. The people who had the patient-centered interviews had less activation at a statistically significant level with a very small M in the anterior insula. Something is happening there in one interview that is deducing this activation. Here's just a test, another testable hypothesis. Antihypertensive given via the patient-centered method have better biopsychosocial outcomes than giving it antihypertensive using an isolated doctor-centered method. The point, we can now test the patient-centered method, therefore we can now test the biopsychosocial model. Okay, this is now opening up research that was not previously possible. I just showed you how we can do hypothesis testing study on outcomes, but what happens between patient-centeredness and positive outcomes? I've showed you what happened in the brain. We've also showed linguistic changes when you're patient-centered. And so these are these immediate effects of the patient-centeredness that take place in the brain and lead to the improved outcomes. What about the mechanism of patient-centeredness? We said that, I've showed you that the patient satisfaction was sky high when we were patient-centered. Has that got anything to do with the outcomes? Is it a mediator or not? What about baseline moderators, say gender, male, female? What's that got to do with the outcome? This is now spawning all these new types of study that need to be done. Uh, pathways, certainly patient-centeredness is not the only explanation of good outcomes. What about access to care, patient agency, uh, social support, a whole host of things? Now that we can define the patient-centered method, we can do these studies and look at these other factors. Okay, 
with an evidence-based patient-centered method to get BPS data. All teachers can now teach the same method. For research, we can now perform the various types of experimental and other research I mentioned. We are recommending implementation of this method for the reasons I've given <clears throat> and for the fact that there are no other behaviorally defined, much less evidence-based methods to accomplish this. This method also meets the six criteria that have been derived in science in general for what's called operationalism. These are the features any method should have in operationalizing its uh, intent. Logically consistent, behaviorally specific, empirically based, technically feasible, repeatable, greater predictability. Here, the biopsychosocial model. Okay? The patient-centered method defines the biopsychosocial model. We've said that. This is much like a land-based telescope formerly defined our understanding of the cosmos, right? And listen to what Heisenberg says in this respect. It's important. We have to remember that what we observe is not nature in itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. Okay? New, we, we are not proposing that this method we've developed is any nirvana or endpoint. This is simply the beginning of what we're going to do to make the biopsychosocial model scientific. New, better methods will certainly develop, perhaps from the Buxbaum Institute, much as the land-based telescope was replaced by the Hubble, right? We got a better view of the heavens. Similarly, we will have, through some of the research I'm alluding to, we can refine and have an even better patient-centered uh, method. In any event, at the present time, this beginning method makes the biopsychosocial model acceptable scientifically, testable, efficient, relevant, and we know now how to do it. What's the impact then, we're coming back full circle, of a scientific biopsychosocial model? We can now include the personhood of each patient and not sacrifice their disease features. The patient is now, as you said up here, the main focus of medicine. Note that in doing this, humanism has been joined with science. We now have a solid theoretical footing to guide major educational and research change. In summary, oh, here is, this is our website. If you're interested in any of the papers I've talked about or, or others, you can find them there. In summary, the disease model works, but there is rampant dissatisfaction. The biopsychosocial model, operationalized by a patient-centered method, corrects this. We now have a scientific biopsychosocial model to, ex to guide these extensive changes that society is demanding. I think that's the last, yes, that's the last one. Thank you. Question. <laughs> Question. DSM, DSM 3, 4, and 5 all exemplify it in its five. And, and to further underscore the relevance and key importance of psychiatry, this patient-centered method stems from psychiatry. It, it really, if you think about it, when we're letting the patient lead, we're letting them free associate. We're focusing on a little bit, but they're free. So these concepts all come straight out of psychiatry at the turn of the century. Thank you. I should have mentioned that. <laughs> yes, it magnified. Saying, without going into all 21 steps, can you talk about some of the 
crucial steps, I guess, the main five steps that you would need? Yeah, the five steps. The first one is uh, setting the patient at ease. The second one was agenda setting. I said we had 30 minutes, what he wanted to cover. The third and fourth ones are the key ones in which you first focus open-endedly, patient-centeredly on the physical. That's what I did with Matt, physical. Then we move to the personal dimension of it, his being at a meeting and, and not being able to, to go see his patients. We then move to the emotional. So how does that make you feel? We then move to the empathic, and I, I will give you a little more information on how, to, how everybody says be empathic, don't they? Nobody ever tells you how. We have a mnemonic <laughs> that we use for this, and I was using it with Matt. Uh, how does it make you feel? He was scared. And you all should remember this, use it with your significant others, with your parents, with your teachers, everybody, it does wonders. <laughs> and it goes like this. Um, so that's scary, name it. I understand, that makes sense to me, I'm understanding it. That's been a tough time for you, thanks for telling me about that. That's a respect statement. Good, let's work on that together. That's a support statement, and that mnemonic is name, understand, respect, support. Nurse, if you complete that, N-U-R-S, you complete it with an E. That's empathic. These are the empathic skills. All of our students and residents know nurses. <laughs> um, and I would encourage all of you, if you don't get anything out of this but that, when you go talk to your spouse or someone tonight, nurse it. When you see somebody that's been up on call all night, nurse them. Um, name, understand, respect, support. These are the empathic skills that people seldom specifically identify. It is in eliciting the personal, then the emotional part of the story, but particularly when you respond to it empathically, that the doctor-patient relationship is maximized. You don't have to hear Matt's multiple chapters of this story, and all patients do. You just need to hear the first chapter or two because it gives you the opportunity to elicit emotion and to nurse it. That's where the relationship comes from. And so the question is about, that's a good question. I felt bad because we didn't have time to kind of go into the details of the method. Oh, then the final step of that is transition to doctor-centered. I said to him, I said, I think I used a nurse statement again, it's been a tough time, let's work on that. If it's okay, I'd like to ask you some specific questions now about your pain. And I then went ahead and did what then, remember, patient-centered is integrated with doctor-centered, was a standard doctor-centered interview. Of course, both doctor-centered interviews would go much longer because that material takes longer. I, I cut them off soon, but the demonstration was there. Here's a question, couple. Yeah, good, good question. And again, suspend that concern about time when you're learning it because it takes time to learn it. This, you're not going to just fall into this like you do doctor centered interviewing. It, it is difficult, it's somewhat counterintuitive, but it's easily learned. It just takes instruction in it. Once you know how to do it, it just comes reflexive. The hardest part of it is learning to go through the five steps and 21 sub-steps, much like when you first did a physical exam. You're sitting there thinking head, eyes, ears, nose, all this kind of stuff, and you're having to kind of pay attention to that. It gets reflexive after a while, and it just, it just comes out. Um, it takes no more than three minutes with most patients, but at the same time, you're being patient-centered. Remember, we started on the physical part, the abdominal pain, patient-centered. You're getting key HPI data right there. It does not have to be repeated. And just parenthetically in that respect, we all like to consider ourselves diagnosticians and pick up things that nobody else picks up. 
It is in the patient-centered interview focusing on the physical symptoms that we often pick up key diagnostic features that have not arisen in doctors doing pure, isolated, doctor-centered interviewing. The reason being we haven't given the patient a chance to talk and we don't think to ask them. They will volunteer it if necessary. In fact, this is what Osler said. Listen to the patient. He's telling you the diagnosis. And we would, in this day and age, append if you're being patient-centered. <laughs> I'm told this is working now. Um, thank you. That was wonderful. I'm also a psychiatrist and a big fan of the biopsychosocial model. <clears throat> In thinking about the patient-centered interview in the context of the doctor-patient relationship, it strikes me that in the context of psychiatric training, there is an awful lot of supervision one-on-one -on -one between a trainee and a supervisor that tends to the emotional and psychological needs of what happens in a doctor-patient relationship interview that is patient-centered when it is empathic time after time after time. So I'm wondering if you've incorporated any individual supervision for your trainees to address that component. Personal supervision and learning this. Yeah, I mean, it, it is critical to it. it. It may not be personal supervision in the sense that we do in psychiatry, but when we teach this to residents and students, and I think this may be what you're getting at. It is important. I didn't address it at all here. This is what I would call interviewing 202. This is advanced interviewing, but it is implicit and certainly is there, is addressing the personal reactions of the interviewer. It, isn't that what you're getting at? Of the student. This is the kind of thing that in psychiatry happens in so-called personal supervision. Um, when we teach this to residents, I would say I had a resident interview Matt, and he went through all that. We don't start critiquing the steps and sub-steps. The first thing we ask is, how was that for you? How'd that go for you? We're getting at there the, at the resident or the student's emotions, and we actually have done a study that showed when you can and there's a big paper we've written on how to do this outside of psychiatry settings, but how we can train in self-awareness in medical settings and trainees. Um, we demonstrated that the trainees who were responsive to this, that developed some self-awareness, became better patient-centered interviewers. And, and what she's getting at, so you know, there, there's a whole issue. We all have it. It's normal. That's what in psychiatry is called countertransference. It's the negative reaction we may have toward a patient or a patient circumstance. This is much more likely to occur when you are being patient-centered because you're asking about personal, emotional things. These may be stressful to you as the interviewer. And so the good teacher has to be cognizant of that. Is that answering your question? Yeah, thank you. I, I thought so. Thank you for asking. It's a good question. The English and you have uh, an interpreter. How yeah. do you <laughs> work with an interpreter? Um, the best thing you can do, and this is not always possible, <coughs> is to find a physician who speaks the same language and transfer them to it. There are, and there's a section in a textbook on this on how you interface with an interpreter. One of the key things is to tell the interpreter, make sure first who the interpreter is. It's not a spouse or somebody like that. It should be independent. If it is a relative and that's all you've got, make sure it's okay with the patient that they are there. I mean, some dicey stuff can come out, and if that's a spouse sitting there that's interpreting, um, then you tell the interpreter, I want you to say exactly 
to her what I'm saying and you say exactly back to me what she is saying. Interpreters, non-professional interpreters have an inclination to digest it all and give you a one-liner of what somebody just talked for five minutes about. Yeah, but it's very, it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very difficult and many doctors are learning Spanish so on. I mean, it, it, I, I can't encourage that enough in whatever language is appropriate to, to, to your community. Yeah. I'm curious if uh, you, you train students and residents to, to use this approach and then they go and they're being supervised and evaluated by physicians that haven't been trained this way. Um, have you run into issues with that and how, how do you handle that because, you know, in, in some ways, the older, you know, uh, a previous generation of physicians might view this as being inefficient or this is just not the way you interview a patient. That's a good question and it does happen. Um, part of that, I think this is where places like the Buckstrom Institute can have an influence, is on the so-called hidden culture of the institution, which often is at higher levels and is counterproductive. Institutes like this can inculcate these better attitudes throughout. But when it happens, um, I'm old enough and gray enough, I can go talk to that preceptor that gave the student or the resident the bad time. And I would encourage you to do that. This is the way you change the so-called hidden culture. Uh, but it, it varies widely from institution to institution. There are some of them where you can just feel it when you walk in. Uh, on the flip side of it, walking into a place like this, it feels radically different. Just like when I walked into the University of Rochester, it's palpable there. And here, people are open to this. They're working for this. And what our task is, is to make this scientific. It has to become mainstream. Here's another. So at risk of sounding like a typical surgeon, which I know I'm going to get ripped when I get done asking this, have you studied this at all among surgical trainees and surgical attendings? Because uh, I think some of the attitudes, and I'm not saying it's right, I think some of the attitudes would be different, and I think it's going to be very challenging to get surgical house staff to want to do this mm -hmm. and surgical attendings to want to do some of the questioning that you're asking, and uh, I think it's appropriate, but I'm sure you would have a tough time convincing some of your surgical yeah. colleagues to do this. We, we actually have worked with some of our surgical people. The, the faculty and the program director invited us to work with them for the reason you're talking about. Um, it, it is different in different dimensions of, of medicine. Um, in teaching surgical people, what, what I have done at least is to truncate some of this so that, and this is what we taught them, was not to go through all five steps and 21 sub-steps, but at least to inquire about the personal dimension of the story. This is really the nuts and bolts of that whole thing. Personal, or the physical dimension, personal dimension, emotion, nurse is to get just that piece of it. I don't even talk to them about steps and sub-steps until we get a little farther along. And if you can teach your surgical residents to nurse anybody in a difficult circumstance, a compound fracture on the way to the emergency surgery or whatever you're doing, and simply say, this is, looks like a tough time for you. I'm here working on you. I'll be in surgery with you, and I'll see you when you get out. Just to be empathic. And let me comment just briefly. These empathic, and these skills we're talking about in being patient-centered have nothing to do with medicine. These are fundamental interpersonal skills. All we've done is systematize them for medicine. And so this is just, this is basic stuff, but this five steps, 21 step steps is simply a way to effectively teach it so it can be deployed in a consistent way. Does that answer your question? I mean, it, 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 but different groups are more difficult. 
Uh, that was actually my next question, is how much more difficult is it to train someone who's been working with patients for a decade to take on these skills compared to a new learner? Yeah, um, new learners have fewer biases. They, typically freshmen, medical students, they haven't been in the system so long, they tend to be a little less jaded and more, you know, more humanistically inclined. Uh, so they're easier to teach, but the problem in teaching first-year medical students is they don't know the disease dimension of it, and they never quite get how this stuff all integrates because they just don't know it. My, my experience has been, we went, we were asked to do a all-day workshop once in Detroit with a bunch of practicing doctors, and they came in, we were talking, and they were just off the wall, irritated and upset about being there. We don't have enough time for this, this isn't working and stuff. And so instead of trying to teach patient-centered interviewing, we just heard them out, listened to them, nursed them. By about 11 o'clock that day, they started identifying some objectives they might have to work better. And by afternoon, they were doing the full-scale thing. And you always teaching anybody, this group, I forgot to tell you, happened to be a group that had been forced to come there because they were having problems in practice. But here, and this, this comes up all the time with any learner, they've got their own stuff in it, and you can't start ramming this down their throat. You've got to hear them out first. Uh, Parker Palmer wrote a nice book, it's called The Courage to Teach, if you ever, but this gets back into interviewing 202, is the, uh, uh, the self-awareness, the personal dimension, the counter-transference in the learner themselves, because we can teach anybody to do five steps and 21 sub-steps, and as long as I'm standing there watching them, they can learn it. This ain't nuclear physics. <laughs> The issue is, are they going to do it when I'm not watching them? And that is why counter-transference, personal awareness stuff has to be addressed concurrently. Yeah, you, you mentioned near the beginning of the talk that you had outcome data on this interview method compared to the traditional biomedical method. Could you just tell us a little bit about the outcomes? Uh, the outcome, um, some of those I showed you there in randomized controlled trials. We did these all with somatizing patients. I, I, as Mark said early in the introduction, I'm also interested in primary care mental health. And I'll answer that in a second. If you think about it, I'm teaching people to be patient-centered, okay? You're patient-centered with somebody, 25% have a major mental health disorder. They are apt to be start telling you about the mental health disorder. And if we are going to teach patient-centeredness, I believe we are obligated to teach how to manage the information we get. And so it was with that, we were doing groups of somatizing patients, high utilizers, 94% prevalence of underlying depression. And so it is in these people that we, in a multidimensional intervention, this wasn't just patient-centeredness leading to outcomes, you, you probably can't do that because the intervention is multifactorial. But in those interventions, it was associated with these positive outcomes. Yeah. And I mean, there's uh, some fantastic stuff coming out on cancer survival and so on. I won't go into this, but it, uh, uh, some recent uh, studies. In, in fact, I'll, I'll tell the audience, um, the, the, the paper I, I think that Dr. Smith was referring to is, is a remarkable paper in the New England Journal written by uh, Jennifer Temel. Uh, at Harvard on, um, on patients with palliative care um, surviving three or four months longer, these patients with advanced cancer surviving three or four months longer than, than the other part of the group who got traditional standard care. 
and, and Dr. Temo will be coming here in the fall, I can't quite remember the date, in, in October, to deliver the Melinda Gordon Memorial Lecture, uh, which, which takes place in this room. It's an annual lecture uh, in memory of Melinda Gordon, who is a student and a resident and a fellow uh, here at the university. So we're going to hear about that data set. In yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. And, and some of the recent stuff, it, it was earlier, there were studies out of California that showed cancer patients were surviving 33 months longer with terminal breast cancer and terminal melanoma. They, they recanted some of that. Follow-up studies didn't quite show it. But the bottom line that has recently come out is that advanced cancers, or stage four cancers, for which there is no good treatment, as compared to things like breast cancer where there is good treatment, the people where there is no good treatment, being patient-centered with them does prolong their lives. In the people with breast cancer, the, the treatable cancers where the treatment itself prolongs it, there is no prolongation, although they live just as long. The idea is that when there is a treatment there, that is eating up what the patient-centered piece would do. And if there's no treatment and you're patient-centered, it's, it's like getting the key, a good chemotherapy. But that, this is fascinating stuff, and it just it keeps evolving. Uh, any other questions, comments, disagreements? Here we go, way in the back. You know, we all use electronic medical records a lot now in the clinic and the outpatient setting. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts about how we can remain patient-centered while using the you know, EMR and being clinically efficient with, uh, with our patients. That's another good question, and there's a section in our book on it. In fact, my friend Rich Frankel, who I was mentioning here, who's got this similar model, wrote the section. Um, it's very difficult. I mean, there are some principles of it, is learn to type. <laughs> I mean, the greatest impediment of this is doctors that don't know how to type. And so learn to type. That enables you to be typing and making contact with the patient. I urge that you do not type or make notes during this brief patient-centered period. You might make a little one like 1997 or something like that just to remind you, but I wouldn't do much of it then. Uh, you don't really need to. If you get the story, you're not going to forget it, uh, and then you can put it down. But the computer should not be between you. Mark is sitting over there and I'm typing here. Rather, it is to the side. I show the patient what's on it. Here's your record, here's your age, here's your diagnosis, and so, so they know what I'm doing. I indicate that I may be periodically going back to it to make some notes or to look things up. But having said all that, um, it makes it more difficult. Uh, what's your experience been? question how does the patient said that method helps with uh, compliance to therapy. You know, I'm a physician scientist mostly interested in the body parts, but really it's frustrating how patients don't take medications and really are uh, not compliant. And how does this help kind of relieve really the compliance issues? Uh, the, the only thing I can say in, in dealing with it is if you've got a persistent compliance issue, adherence, some people say, um, it, it hasn't responded to the simple things like marking the pills and whatever you might need to do. If it's not responding to that, this almost always bespeaks some psychological issue. Accordingly, from a patient-centered standpoint, you need to get to the bottom of that. And this is what then I was talking about earlier. This now enables you, by being patient-centered, to figure out what that issue is. It may be depression, or they may just, in telling the story, have been embarrassed to tell you they can't afford it, or their husband is stealing it, or something like that. I don't know what it might be, but being patient-centered, you will at least find out what it is, particularly getting the emotion with it, and then addressing both the personal and emotional stuff, plus devising a strategy to correct it in context of the personal and emotional stuff. Uh, 
almost all of these adherence problems, there's some underlying psychological issue going on. It, it, it needn't be pathological. It may be as simple as I can't afford it, but they're embarrassed to tell you and so on, but there is something personal and psychological. Um, I just want to say a quick word. Um, our, our, the next talk in this series, Marie, Marie, the next talk in this series is going to be um, uh, Dr. Wendy Levinson from Toronto, who's going to be uh, speaking on April 25th on the topic of talking with patients. So we will we'll continue this theme. Um, and, and that will be part of the Buckspan Annual Symposium, which will not be in this room, but will be in the beautiful new boardroom of the CCD. I, I don't know if you've seen that room, but it's, a, it's particularly attractive up on the seventh floor. <laughs> uh, and that'll, that'll be on April 25th uh, in the afternoon with, with, with box lunches. And then, um, uh, and then Dr. Levinson will speak, I think, at 1 o'clock. So, 1 o'clock. Um, followed by the, the Buxbaum Symposium, which will have talks by our medical students and uh, junior faculty and senior faculty. So I hope you all jot that down. But, but please, please join me now in thanking Dr. Smith. Great job. Thank <laughs> you.